Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guests today are the leaders of the Wilson Center's oldest and largest regional program, the Venerable Kennan Institute, the, the Institute's director, Matt Rajansky, and its deputy director, Will Pomeranz. And at least for me, on a now broadcast, this is the first time that I've had both of you together, and it's very exciting. It's great to see both of you. Glad to be here, John. Very so before be we we dig into the, the topic where we're going to talk about the recent vote on amendments to Russia's constitution and the changes that that portends and what its implications may be moving forward, I want to begin with a, a bit of Kennan Institute trivia for the sake of our viewers and listeners. Uh, Everyone, I think, assumes that the Institute is named after George F. Kennan, but it's not, right? Tell us who the George Kennan is that the center is actually, or the Institute is actually named after. So I'll give you the short version, John, uh, but my own understanding of this has evolved over the years. Uh, the, the important thing is that George F. Kennan was among the first scholars ever brought to the Wilson Center, and that uh, scholar role is written into the statute, the act of Congress that created the Wilson Center. And so, you know, it's very much at the origins of the existence of this place uh, that George F. Kennan shows up in the building, but his condition for showing up was that he would be able to create uh, an institute in Washington that would be a home for uh, university type uh, academic quality scholarship about Russia. Uh, and he used the term Russia. He did not talk about the Soviet Union, even though it was the early 1970s at that time. Uh, and when asked why, by the way, he said, uh, because uh, I believe that Russia is uh, going to be around forever, but the Soviet Union won't. That was, of course, very prescient. Um, and and uh, Jim Billington, who was the first director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, accepted that condition and rose to the challenge and created what became the first of the Wilson Center's regional programs. The kind of device of saying that the Kennan name uh, was that of George Kennan the Elder. This was a 19th century uh, early relative of George F. Kennan, who was an American explorer in Siberia, part of the expedition to try to connect North America and Europe by telegraph over the Bering Strait rather than across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it's a bit of a fiction uh, because, of course, it's named for George Kennan. He was the founder, after all. Uh, but this was a way for him to also pay homage to his relative. And I think um, if you've read, you know, Kennan's diaries or his uh, two volume uh, memoir, uh, you'll see he was always wrestling uh, with his own self image. And I think this was a way uh, for him to kind of reduce the moral pressure of naming an institution after himself, when after all, he couldn't afford to endow it. Well, it's a, it's a great story, no matter which George Kennan we're talking about. Thanks, Matt. Uh, let's, as we transition to the topic, Will, let me ask you about the vote itself and, and how we should think about it in terms of democracy. Is this a legitimate exercise in democracy? Well, uh, unfortunately, it is not a legitimate exercise in democracy. Uh, a lot of different variations took place in order to allow this vote to happen during the time of coronavirus. So instead of having it on a single day, uh, they had the election spread out over a week. Instead of having to go to your polling place, uh, your polling place actually came to you and your apartment or your place of work were able to vote there. Third, there are significant charges of voter fraud. Um, it has been estimated by one uh, academic that as many as 20 million plus votes are fraudulent in this constitutional referendum. Uh, there were various prizes for showing up. Uh, state uh, independent monitors were not allowed to observe the actual voting. So there are lots of different and plausible uh, explanations as to why the vote was so high. It's actually 78% for the Constitution. Um, there are other irregularities that I can go into. Uh, the Constitution doesn't even allow for such a plebiscite. Uh, they didn't observe the rules for referendums. Uh, this is a very suspect vote in terms of its legitimacy. Matt, the, the, given what Will just described, who is the audience for what essentially is a bit of a dog and pony show? It's, 
a very important question, right? Why, why conduct this exercise at all when almost nobody doubts that Vladimir Putin is the end all and be all of political power in Russia? And the answer may be in part because he knows that he's a mortal man. Um, he's nobody's fool. And he understands uh, that as occurred the last time that there was some question about whether he would remain at the pinnacle of political power, that was 2007 when he did the so-called castling maneuver to comply with the letter of the constitution, if not its spirit, and made Dmitry Medvedev president while he was prime minister. Um, what actually happened was elites uh, coalesced around Medvedev, uh, worked to convince Medvedev, and I think uh, ultimately successfully, if abortively, that he should run again, that he should try to hold on to power and be a real president for a second four-year term, uh, and that that was really perceived as a threat by Putin and those around him, uh, and that the idea of elite factioning, even if it's something that Putin takes advantage of in many cases to be the ultimate arbiter of disputes within the Kremlin elite, um, you don't want to have rival factions with potential rival chiefs. And so I think what Putin is doing is rather than permitting speculation for the next three years about whether he would fade into the background again when his now second of his second set of terms finishes, uh, the key provision of the 200 some quote unquote amendments to the Russian constitution was the one that zeroes out quote unquote his presidential terms such that in effect under this new constitution, I keep using quotes because, you know, it doesn't mean anything in our legal terms, but under this new constitution, he gets to start over at zero. Um, that sends as a signal to the Russian elite uh, that there will not be a competition uh, to support one or another candidate to replace him, whether it's Medvedev or uh, Sergei Sobyanin, the mayor of Moscow, uh, or Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister, any of the, the popular figures, even if Putin had said, no way, nothing doing, I'm not going to pick a successor, the mere fact that he didn't have a clear plan to remain in power after 2024 until this vote, uh, I think would have created that elite faction. And then a final small point, um, I think he is trying to signal to the Russian people more broadly, um, hence the need for a certain degree of majority turnout. Uh, we've actually published uh, some analysis this week you can find on the Kennan Institute website uh, based on uh, the work of Sergei Shpilkin, uh, a Russian uh, phys uh, physicist turned statistician, who basically concludes that you know there was nothing like a majority supporting uh, these amendments. But nonetheless, uh, the appearance of there being a popular majority is really key to Putin's general image that I'm the only one in Russia who has a popular mandate. I don't have to steal elections. I'm genuinely popular. Thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, we will revisit Putin, obviously, because that is the thing, the, the, the president for life aspect of these amendments that everyone wants to talk about. But before we do that, Will, I want to ask you, anything else in these multiple amendments worth mentioning? Changes that are really substantive versus symbolic? Um, what I think is really important about this constitution, I'll say two things. One, with the means by which he introduced the amendments, the Constitution now is filled with contradictions. And they're contradictions that are stated from the beginning as the general principles and are now undermined by the amendments. So that principles such as a nascent uh, division of powers, the independence of local self-government, the in independence of the constitutional court, uh, the, the, the notion of a secular state, the notion of a non-ideological state. All these principles that are now still in the Constitution are contradicted by Putin's amendments. So what you have is a much more incoherent and internally inconsist inconsistent Constitution. And I think what that means in, uh, uh, additionally is that Putin now owns this Constitution. Uh, it was the Yeltsin Constitution, uh, many leaders have had a constitution over the 20th century. Lenin had a constitution, Stalin had a constitution, Brezhnev, etc. Uh, now, in light of these amendments, uh, this is Putin's constitution. And instead of being a forward-looking document, it is really a defensive do do document. And the primary goal is for Putin to retain power. So essentially what you're describing is if, if 
you have a constitution that is filled with contradictions, it creates a void, and Vladimir Putin is the substance filling that void as since nature abhors a vacuum. Exactly. It, it allows for informal rule. Now, I'm, I'm not here to say that the 1993 Yeltsin Constitution was a masterful document. Uh, it was not. Uh, it was played with inconsistencies as well. Uh, these kind of laid the framework for a more liberal and more democratic Russia. I think Putin's constitution closes the opportunity. So Matt, what do you see arising from this, these contradictions? You know, thus far, uh, the precedent over 20 years of Putin's power has been, um, he is largely reactive within a certain very broad kind of strategic framing. That strategic framing uh, is arguably reflected in the Constitution, and Will's uh, written a brilliant book about this, as it is reflected in, in almost every Russian legal document and legal institution, and that is the primacy of the Russian state. So his, his broad strategy is to agglomerate power uh, principally in the Russian state. For example, we talk a lot about oligarchs in Russia, but these oligarchs are not the same as the oligarchs who briefly emerged in the kind of wild 1990s, or the oligarchs of Ukraine, or the oligarchs, uh, frankly, of our own country. They're state oligarchs. They are servants of the Kremlin, and in them, as vehicles of state power, resides essentially the wealth uh, and the influence of the state, and they are tapped. They are, they are asked to do certain things on behalf of the state with, with a lot of frequency. Um, for example, uh, highly sensitive infrastructure projects uh, that you could imagine, you know, a, 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 an independent uh, billionaire international business person walking away from, like building a bridge to illegally annex Crimea. You know, that's something that, you know, Putin taps a state oligarch who's one of his buddies, but also essentially an official and says, do it and they do it. Um, so my sense is it's not the law that is going to determine the conduct of power in Russia. It's the fact of power in Russia that is going to determine the shape of laws. And the constitution is very reflective of that, but as Will has said, it's not like the 1993 constitution wasn't reflective of that. It may have had a few nods at liberal democracy and a kind of bottom-up organic legislative process, but that was never the case. I mean, except for a few years in the 90s that the Duma never functioned that way. Beyond what uh, Americans might prefer or champions of democracy might prefer or wh whomever you might you might identify. Uh, is this good or bad news for Russia as a nation? Does, does a, a president for life, the president being Vladimir Putin, speak to stability and uh, uh, some sort of strength that will serve the country well, or does it portend uh, stagnation? I think, well, I think you've hit the, go ahead. Go ahead, you've hit the two go ahead. words uh, right, right on the nail. Uh, Putin's argument is that it leads to stability. Mm -hmm. And that is his goal, and that anything that interrupts or deflects from that stability is bad, and he wants to prevent that. I think his argument, Putin's argument, is that it will lead to greater stability, and Matt alluded to that because there was some question about Putin's successor. And by introducing this amendment, he is now no longer a lame duck, but can theoretically be there until 2036. Um, the question is, what is Putin going to do differently over the next 16 years that he hasn't done over the previous 20 years? And it's very hard to, he hasn't really said what he wants to do. Uh, he says he wants to kind of uh, promote, as we said, stability, um, address some of the social issues that are still uh, prevalent in the Russian Federation. But reality, I think the recipe is stagnation. Um, there will be no political turnover for the next 16 years, other than the turnover that Putin permits. Uh, there won't be any changes of power. There won't be any free and fair elections if Putin has his way. Um, and that simply will mean that the status quo persists. And there are examples of rulers in Russian history uh, who have uh, insisted that stability and national integrity are the key crucial uh, principles of the Russian Federate of, of Russia, whether it be imperial, Soviet, or post-Soviet. Um, that is what Putin's going to be doing. He's going to be a defensive uh, president. Um, and I think he this this is a recipe for a 
global economic stagnation. And the final point I'll say is that one of the things that Putin fears the most is any spontaneous protest. And he has introduced several severe uh, legislation in order to make sure that these protests don't get out of control. So I think Putin has promised stability. Um, the results most likely will be economic and political stagnation. It doesn't mean that Putin's rule is immediately challenged, uh, but over the long term, it means the dis discontent gets, gets pushed down. And when it does ex uh, manifest itself, it does so in large scale protests. Matt, I, I, I'm guessing that you largely agree with Will, but any additional thoughts as we look ahead? Yeah, I, I agree. I wanna underscore the last point, that the, the less uh, the system leaves room for pluralism leaves room. And I'm not talking about the flourishing of liberal democratic principles. This can still be very much in a kind of conservative Russian Eurasianist uh, context, but you know, the, the less that, uh, to use the Soviet term, new cadres can come up in the system and, and really flourish and develop. Even the Soviet system allowed that to some degree. It had a mechanism for it. Um, the more all that energy is going to be bottled up and, and potentially can be very explosive uh, and I think negative for the society. Um, so, you know, none of us, none of us wish to see violent change in Russia, but I think ironically that becomes more likely at some distant point in the future. Um, then the one other point I would add to what Will said, you know, I, I basically think of uh, lines that I've heard from, from the two Vyacheslavs in the Russian Duma, Vyacheslav Volodin, the speaker of the Duma, who said, you know, uh, there is no Russia without Putin. And therefore, uh, when we ask what will be after Putin, the answer must be Putin. Uh, so stability. Uh, and the other line is from uh, Vyacheslav Nikonov, who is the grandson of Molotov, uh, the Soviet foreign minister under Stalin. Uh, and he is a member of the Duma. And when asked by BBC, Western, you know, UK radio, uh, to describe how this vote was in any way democratic, he said, well, it's entirely consistent with the will of the Russian people, and it's entirely against the will of meddling outsiders like, forgive me, the United Kingdom and the United States. And I do think a very big part of the narrative from the Kremlin is that this is good for the Russian people because if we weren't doing this, there might be some mamsy-pamsy liberal, you know, weak figurehead. But basically, America would be running the show here in Russia, and that would be very bad for you. Does the stagnation model internally... Uh extend to Russia's world, uh, role in the world internationally. I mean, what will look different? We've seen military aggression regionally and meddling in foreign elections. And now we may be talking about bounties on US troops in Afghanistan and you know, all kinds of, what, what doesn't look like leadership looks more like uh, uh, mischief, really. Uh, yeah. What about Russia's role internationally? So I have, I, I dissent a little bit from what seems to be the Washington consensus on this. I, I, I agree uh, that the United States and, and Russia have a serious problem. I, I agree that we have absolutely diametrically opposed worldviews. But I think in part, um, the, the reason that the problem translates into the kind of um, malign activity, that's the term that is used in Washington, it's even cited in legislation sanctioning Russia on the part of Russia, is because the Russians don't see any better options. Uh, they've done things that we object to. Uh, we have hammered them with sanctions and isolation and other forms of punishment. Uh, but because we won't do the one thing that during the Cold War was always the beginning of managing conflict and avoiding crises, which is to negotiate, we, we won't do that. We are absolutely dead set on the idea that w we will pressure the Russians into reversing their bad behavior. Uh, and I think the Russians are dead set on bringing us to the negotiating table. And so they keep ratcheting up the bad behavior. So you know, my, my policy view on this is that we have got to find that space, that zone, which is not you know, rolling over and accepting bad behavior by, by Moscow, because that will also encourage more bad behavior, uh, but, is, but is also not sort of, uh, we don't talk to people we disagree with, and therefore you know, they keep doing it. Matt, you introduced the notion of the neighbor paradigm in a piece you just wrote in the National Interest. Would you explain that, the, the whole notion of thinking of Russia as a neighbor? Yeah, certainly. So, so I co-wrote this piece with uh, Michael Kimmage, who serves on the Kennan Institute Advisory Council, is a professor at Catholic University. Um, and, and the basic argument is simple, which is, you know, as uh, 
uh, Angela Stent at Georgetown and uh, many other uh, good scholars on Russia have told the history of U.S.-Russia relations and cycles. And there are cycles that really alternate between uh, polar extremes. One is, uh, you know, cooperation almost to the degree of alliance, but certainly unrealistically high expectations for the alignment of interests between two very fundamentally different nations that have always been very different. Uh, and the other is conflict, you know, whether it's a hot war, a cold war, uh, sort of ambiguous uh, war, hybrid war, whatever it is, but it's, but it's real conflict. And, and the reality of flailing back and forth between these two extremes is extremely destructive, and it's, and it's far too high risk uh, for the world's two leading nuclear powers. And so our argument is not simply for a happy medium. It's for a different psychological framing of the relationship. Look, you may get along great with your neighbor. They're still your neighbor. They're not a member of your family. You know, you're not responsible for everything that they do, nor are they responsible for what you do. And, and they don't have to share your values and your worldview. But by the same token, you can have very serious disagreements with your neighbor and need to, to erect fences, you know, draw red lines. Um, and, and it's that psychology that gives rise to the central question, which is, can we find a way to live with Russia as it is and not have an unrealistic ambition of changing Russia through pressure or through inducement uh, or raise unrealistic expectations, as, as I believe the last administration did with the 2009 reset. And that question will be answered in the context of a potential, another change of administrations in the United States. So it's, it could be very messy. Uh, gentlemen, before I let you go, this has been terrific, but I want to ask you each to comment on sort of the end game question. Is there an end game in Vladimir Putin's uh, worldview of himself as leader for life in Russia and as a major player in bringing Russia back from how it was characterized as a regional power post-Cold War to a, uh, one of the, the, the big three neighbors in the global community. Is there an end game? Is there a plan? Or is this just muddling along? Will, why don't you begin? Okay, I'll, I'll answer briefly. I don't think Putin's really interested in domestic affairs for the most part. Um, I think if he muddles through, that's fine. Uh, I think the economy as it exists today from Putin's perspective um, is fine because what he wants is enough modernization, enough stability, so that he can pursue opportunities on a international and global stage. I think if you look at why Putin is sticking around, he's not sticking around to be a transformational leader of domestic politics. He's sticking around so that he, and I believe that he alone believes, that he can take advantage of the opportunities as they present themselves globally, and so that Russia remains a global power. Matt. Yeah, uh, just quickly, I mean, you can look at this on a lot of different levels. On one level, it's a treadmill he just can't get off, right? There isn't, at this point, a way for him to fade away into retirement and be remembered as a great ex-president of Russia. Uh, he's gonna be president for life, that's pretty clear, one way or another. Second is that there's no precedent. In the entire post-Soviet region, there isn't an end game. There is not a single one of these leaders who has successfully negotiated transition completely out of power. Uh, they've either died in office or they've been deposed uh, or there's been a revolution that ends their tenure. Um, and the third is, you know, this is a fundamentally human question. This isn't just about Russia. Uh, the human lifespan is finite. Uh, Putin himself talks about Russia as a thousand year history, right? He's, he's very fond of that phrase, our millennium of history. He wrote an article about this uh, just a month ago, talking about World War II and talking about Russia's thousand years of history. Um, well, it's pretty clear Vladimir Putin, no matter what, is not going to be around for the second thousand years of Russia's history. So at best, he will be consigning his legacy to historians and to the Russian people to decide what it is. And I, I think it is going to be very much like human beings from time immemorial. You know, what are the pyramids that he built that outlast him? And some of those will be physical, right? The, the fact that Russia is in a lot better shape than it was not as good as it could have been, maybe. And some of it will be metaphorical, political, psychological. Uh, and, and history will be the judge. And those of us who hope to outlive him, I don't want to jinx myself, uh, we'll get to judge that as well. Well, I don't want to jinx us either, but I, I think the Kennan Institute will be there to report, no matter what happens to the three of us or to the rest of the world. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. The Kennan Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Institute for life. Matt Ujanski, Will Pomerantz, thanks for joining us. I hope that uh, our viewers and listeners enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now as well. And I want to thank you for being here. And please join us again. We'll be back with more. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching.